Welcome everyone to On Crime and Punishment. This is a podcast produced by the Center for Criminological Research at the University of Alberta. In this episode, Kevin Haggerty, one of our faculty members, interviews Justin Pichet of the University of Ottawa. Justin is an associate professor in the Department of Criminology at the University of Ottawa. For more than a decade, he has been engaged in action research projects that examine how state authorities incorporate and neutralize critiques of and alternatives to imprisonment to inform community organizing oriented around enhancing the human rights of criminalized people and promoting their liberation. He currently serves as director of the Carceral Studies Research Collective and co-editor of the Journal of Prisoners and On Prisons, which is a peer-reviewed journal featuring articles written by current and former prisoners published by the University of Ottawa Press. Justin is also a member of the Criminalization and Punishment Education Project, which runs the Jail Accountability and Information Line that works in solidarity with people held at the Ottawa Carleton Detention Centre to address human rights issues they face. And in this conversation, Justin and Kevin will be talking about Justin's work, uh, his work particularly in opposing the construction of new prisons in Ontario and in the rest of Canada, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on prisoners in Canada's criminal justice system, and both the case for and the future of the prison abolition movement in Canada. Welcome, and today we're talking with Professor Justin Pichet at uh, the University of Ottawa. Um, for some of the stuff we're going to be talking about, I think the timeline is important. So today is November 6th, and we were just saying we're eagerly anticipating the results of the American election, and kind of that's where we are. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit, introducing Professor Pichet, talking about his research and some uh, research and interests around prisons, COVID, and uh, some of the politics around uh, these issues. So uh, I will refer to you as Justin. So <laughs> uh, how are you doing? Good, yourself? Very good. Um, so maybe just a good place to start for people who might not know you and know your work. Maybe just a little bit of a, a summary of who you are and what some of your interests are. Right. So um, I'm generally interested in all things prisons, but uh, more specific to that, I'm, I'm interested in looking at how it is that we naturalize imprisonment as a necessary response uh, to criminalize conflicts and harms. And trying to understand that through kind of various different entry points. So looking at, for instance, how um, we justify imprisonment or neutralize alternatives to imprisonment in the context of trying to build uh, new prisons and new carceral spaces, um, looking also at how we justify prison or neutralize alternatives to imprisonment um, in the context of, of um, discussions around alternatives to incarceration, such as those that have come up during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and then also looking at uh, how it is that we, we talk about imprisonment in the context of um, uh, popular culture and mostly looking at how uh, police museums, courthouse museums and prison museums uh, reproduce this idea of, of, of prison being necessary um, and being useful um, as a response uh, to uh, violence um, and other forms of, of law breaking. And so um, a lot of that work I, I've been doing with uh, Kevin Walby from the University of Winnipeg, some of the stuff on, on carceral expansion, I've been doing that work with members of the Criminalization and Punishment Education Project around our NOPE campaign, which has meant the O in the NOPE campaign has meant different things. So it's it's meant uh, in the context of our local organizing against new and bigger uh, jails in Eastern Ontario, it's meant the No Ottawa Prison Expansion Campaign. Sometimes when we've tried to take a wider lens against prison expansion across Ontario at the provincial level, it's been the No Ontario Prison Expansion Campaign. Right. And sometimes when we expand the lens even further than that, it's just been No on Prison Expansion campaign where we're looking elsewhere across the country. And so that's a bit about what I'm involved in uh, research-wise. And 
I study these things and involved in projects with others that study these things as a means of trying to understand uh, what kind of spaces may exist for us to try and resist this idea of, of prison necessity and the necessi necessity of, of criminalization and punishment more broadly to kind of, kind of seize on, on openings to inform um, you know, social movement work and community organizing to try and build alternatives to policing uh, to punitive injustice, to imprisonment and other forms of sanctions as as responses. And yeah, so it's meant like a lot of that knowledge that we're developing is meant to inform praxis, um, whether it be creating new tour scripts at the Ottawa jail hostel, uh, like Kevin and I are doing right now, or, or you know, uh, looking at uh, organizing different campaigns against prison construction, which CPEP's involved in, or even uh, trying to do some COVID organizing with this uh, newly formed abolition coalition. So, I mean, the, the, the politics that animate, I guess, the research questions that I'm interested in, as well as how we deploy that knowledge once we've, we've gathered and analyzed the data is to try and figure out how it can be used towards abolishing these uh, uh, carceral control in the long term, and of course, trying to diminish the harm and use of, of criminalization and imprisonment in the short term, because, you know, we're not, uh, we're not abolishing prisons tomorrow, but we can, we can work towards those objectives and then study what's happening in response to abolitionist organizing and not have that inform future action. So, yeah, so that's a bit of what I, what I've been up to for a while. The no stuff, the no to expansion. I mean, maybe you talk a little bit about sort of the, the reception amongst different constituencies to that have the, I mean, is this something that you're able to get people behind? Are there particular strategies that you, you've you been able to use to sort of get people to recognize the problems involved? Well, maybe I could speak specifically like to the Ottawa focus of, of that work. So um, CPEP started with Carleton University and University of Ottawa students and professors gathering and, and over time uh, there's been criminalized people who have been involved, their loved ones, uh, even practitioners and policymakers here locally that have, have come to that group. And, you know, with this kind of goal of like trying to reduce the harms and use of, of imprisonment and some members working um, through more of a reformist angle initially and, and others like myself uh, being more inclined towards abolitionist politics. And then over time, uh, you know, we turned our focus to what was happening at our local jail at the Ottawa Carleton Detention Center and, and had a, organized a lot of public forums on the remand crisis. You know, the fact that the majority of prisoners in our provincial jail are, are awaiting their day in court, organizing forums on conditions of confinement with the goal, of course, to, to try and get people out and keep them out and have community-based alternatives built. And you know, there was a task force that came into place in 2016 by the Ontario Ministry of, Commu uh, of Community Safety and Correctional Services because there was a bunking of, of prisoners in, sh in showers, and that became a pretty big local scandal, and there was a task force organized around that. You know, they recommended different things to diminish the population at OCDC and to uh, address conditions of confinement there. They did not recommend building a new prison. Right. And in our discussions with the ministry at the time, we were involved in, in um, some consultation sessions to inform the development of new provincial wide legislation on imprisonment. And, you know, we didn't have a sense during those discussions and our participation in it that they were going to be building new prisons. And in fact, uh, we were writing op eds at the time saying, you know, building new prisons isn't going to solve anything. It'll just um, create more of an incentive for this remand issue to continue and, and different car carceral clawbacks to emerge that, that will um, prevent fundamental changes happening in society uh, in terms of addressing the needs of criminalized people. And yeah, and the minister came out at that time in 2016 say, and agreed, saying that, that building new prisons uh, would amount uh, to a failure. That was the word he used. It would be a failure for taxpayers. And then a year later, minister a minister uh, changes and we get this announcement in May 2017 in the middle of uh, the Critical Perspectives Conference, actually, which is a meeting of Canadian critical criminologists. 
every year that they're building this new and bigger prison. I remember I was chairing a panel at the time at, at nine in the morning and, and someone interrupted the panel to let us know that they were building a new prison and that, that shot that day for me. Um, <laughs> But, you know, we organized a uh, no Ottawa prison expansion campaign literally from that day we were passing out. We started a petition that day. Um, we started cranking out more and more op-eds. Um, at one point, the province had tried to organize a public consultation uh, and they sent, sent out a very short list of invitees. And we responded saying, with a list of like over 100 organizations that should be invited. And then they backed off and said, oh, we realized that we need to kind of take a step back here to consult more widely. And uh, um, essentially, instead of uh, organizing a public consultation at the Marriott Hotel in downtown Ottawa, they, they canceled that. So we organized a protest and, you know, got a lot of different people from the community to participate that wrote some more op-eds with some like concrete alternatives emerging from some of those groups as well. And uh, yeah, by then it was provincial election time. Doug Ford got in. Uh, we continued on with different uh, kinds of campaigning strategies and we didn't hear from them for, it was almost three years before there was any news as to what they were going to do. And, uh, you know, so we at least, I think, paper wrenched them in the sense like we we slowed things down. And ultimately, they decided they weren't going to replace OCDC with a new and bigger jail. They've announced a couple months ago um, on August 27th that uh, they're not going to build a new and bigger jail in Ottawa. Instead, they're going to develop what they've called this Eastern Region Strategy, where they're going to build a new prison, a new small 235 bed prison in Kempville, which is about 40 minutes outside of Ottawa, down the 416 for those who know the area. They're going to replace the Brockville Jail, which was built in 1842 with a bigger jail on the grounds of the St. Lawrence uh, Treatment and Correctional Center in Brockville, which they're also going to expand uh, with a new women's unit for women living with mental health issues, and then expanding the Napanee um, deten or the Quinty Detention Center in Napanee. And then oh, once all that's done, they'll decide what they're going to do with OCDC. Indications have, have been that they'll keep the newer parts of the jail that were built during the Mike Harris, uh, Ernie Eves years, uh, during the Common Sense Revolution, if we want to call it that. That's what they called it. Um, uh, and uh, kind of demolish the rest of it and rebuild it uh, back up. So that's kind of the talk right now. So what I could say is that uh, <laughs> um, I think like the organizing that we've done, um, uh, in Ottawa was effective and and I mean we'll, we'll never know for sure until we get access to documents or or someone who, that explains why this plan shifted over time but I mean I think the fact that they're not building a new and bigger jail in Ottawa proper uh, and and are kind of doing this piecemeal thing across the region suggests that they recognize that they were perhaps in a fight they might not win locally and so they took it regionally and uh, you know, including in places where they already have carceral infrastructure in uh, Napanee and Brockville. So there's no opposition there. The mayors were very happy to, to have that. But there is opposition building up in Kempville right now, uh, which is pretty interesting to see. And CPEP will be um, participating in an emerging coalition of folks who are against it. And I guess what we're trying to do is there's a lot of NIMBY sentiments, not in my backyard sentiments in Kempville. And, you know, so opposing the jail because it's in Kempville. And what we're going to try and do through this is try and bring more and more people uh, on board with the idea of not, not in any backyard, um, right. you know, that we should actually be investing in community-based alternatives and, and um, use it as an opportunity uh, for public education on, on things that we've been doing for almost a decade. So we'll see how that, all plays out, but the province, I think, really miscalculated the openness of Kempville, this community of 4,000 people wanting this prison, right. because uh, they, like about five years ago, the, the previous liberal government provincially uh, closed a college campus that was affiliated with the University of Guelph that was farming, and this land is all farming land, and they want to put a big prison on it and like razor bulldoze right. <laughs> the with the buildings that are there and Kempville actually had a plan to to redevelop that for for commerce and for um agriculture purposes so they're in for a bit of a fight we're we're going to hopefully get people to to fight in a way that that is more inclusive of criminalized people as opposed to opposing something because of fear 
of Kermalai's people and their families coming to town and, and uh, associated uh, fears with respect to victimization rates and, and other things that, are, that very much aren't really supported by research, really, you know, uh, so we'll see where that all goes. But um, mm. that's kind of what we've been um, up to lately, meeting with folks in Kempville and, and uh, helping them navigate this process that's kind of just been dumped on them. They were really taken by taken by surprise and especially by the lack of public consultation and the ministries indicated that the contract to design, build, finance and maintain the facility won't be signed until 2023. So it will be a provincial election issue in 2022. And um, hopefully we'll, we will try and contribute to a scenario where, where we can, again, show that punishment doesn't pay like we did with uh, the former minister Yasser Nakfi for Ottawa Centre. We campaigned for candidates who were uh, opposed to prison expansion and we showed up at all the town halls, asked them some really tough questions. And he was the one that said prisons fail taxpayers. He was replaced by another minister who says new and bigger jail in Ottawa, uh, but he was still part of cab cabinet. He was the attorney general. So, you know, we kind of you know, were you lying to us or were you, were you just not uh, able to, to convince your colleagues of the positions you previously held? And of course, we actually found out during this that he had commissioned a study um, by Park and Architects to review infrastructure at existing facilities to find out whether they'd recommend building new and bigger prisons. So when he said it's going to fail taxpayers at the same time, he was initiating a review. So we got them and we helped along with other community organizers to get them out of office. So, yeah, so that's kind of, uh, I guess something we'll try and replicate again in, uh, in a, in a rural community. So we'll see how that, how that plays out. The dynamics are a bit different than when you're trying to do something like that in downtown Ottawa, but, um, there's some good people out in Kempville and, and, uh, it'll be interesting to, to, to say the very least. So in connection with what you were describing, when you're doing your activism, um, do you find that yourself, you, you sort of described being with strange bedfellows. So there's lots of reasons to oppose prisons and prison construction. Most of us and you in particular, these are ethical concerns. These are political concerns about inequity. And, but you end up with people who are concerned about NIMBY and costs and other things. How, do you, how, I don't know, how easy of a partnership are these types of kind of coalitions? I think for me, like the kinds of research questions I would associate with that in the service of kind of, of abolitionist objectives is to think about, okay, like what are the justifications that are being advanced for prison expansion and then study on the flip side, like what are the justifications being advanced for resisting it? And are those like in line with, with liberatory uh, outcomes or really are we just kind of participating in exclusion uh, with a different kind of um, angle uh, to it, I suppose, um, even though, like, like you say, it makes for strange bedfellows. And what I would say is, um, like, for, for the work that CPEP does, it involves, like, action research, studying what's happening on the ground, and then, and then using that analysis to inform subsequent actions. So, like, now seeing, for instance, that, like, the Kempville folks <clears throat> are primarily uh, opposed to the facility uh, because of concerns about uh, fear of, of uh, criminalized acts, about property values, about whether or not jobs will translate or whether or not they'll, they'll get jobs, I should say, out of, out of this so-called carceral windfall that the pro province is promising. So studying those things and then thinking about, okay, how can we unsettle uh, some of the narratives that actually don't challenge the necessity of prisons, right? If anything, some of those discourses actually, particularly around fear of victimization and like fear of, of prisoners' families and, and so on. These are actually things that I think we, we need to debunk in our organizing, um, have Kempville um, residents meet with criminalized people and their loved ones um, to kind of bridge that social distance that exists uh, between uh, the punished and, and authors of punishment, which is the rest of us. Uh, that live in a society that punishes and cages people and seeing how that can unsettle a narrative in a way that would contribute towards more opposition and opposition based in this idea that that 
perhaps we shouldn't be criminalizing and imprisoning people. Perhaps we should be building communities in different ways instead. And so that's kind of how I guess I do the <clears throat> gymnastics in my head is like what's going on. And even if, like you say, these NIMBY sentiments could be temporarily useful if we really, if our goal was on its own was just to shut down uh, that project. But like in the long term, I would see it as like being an impediment to abolitionist uh, organizing beyond that. So, so to actually try and use that, not as a means of like saying like CPEP's going to be um, fully behind NIMBY. No, mm-hmm. um, that we're actually going to try and move people uh, in a way and, and, and bring them to a, to a different place that actually challenges criminalization and incarceration. And so, um, and that's, to me, that's a political, it's a political problem. It's a research problem. It's and a, it's, uh, a, it's a strategic yeah. problem. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned NIMBY. I don't know. I think I mentioned this to you before, but I grew up and lived for oh, two decades a mile away from OCDC. So okay. that, was my, that was my kind of backyard. Uh, the place was always there. Um, you talked about sort of the, the changes prompted in relationship. What's your sense of the current situation? In, not the COVID situation. We'll get to that in a second, but just the, the, the current situation in the Ottawa Carlton Detention Center generally. So, I mean, uh, one of the things that the Criminalization and Punishment Education Project does do uh, as we recognize that abolitionism or abolition is not happening like tomorrow is that we do run a a jail hotline. It's called jail, actually. It's a jail accountability and information line. uh, And it takes calls from OCDC prisoners from 1 to 4 p.m. on weekdays. and, And those calls are focused on conditions of confinement issues and trying to address what you can to the extent that you can in the site of human caging, such as that one, and uh, also trying to connect people to community support so that once they re-enter the community and leave OCDC, that that they're better supported to, to be able to stay out and, and not go back into uh, what has been for many a revolving door. And so we're kind of doing that to reduce the use or reduce the harms of imprisonment with the conditions of confinement side and as well as trying to re- reduce the use of imprisonment more broadly. Um, and I would say like the kinds of things that we were hearing uh, pre-pandemic were really, you know, basic, basic things. Like, I mean, I think the, the, the major thing, which I, I mean, wouldn't surprise you and, or others who, who study imprisonment in, in Canada or, or elsewhere is, is um, access to healthcare and, uh, access to, to, to mental health care. And yeah, and, and a lot of barriers with respect to that. A lot of folks who have been criminalized because they've been living with mental health or drug use issues and, you know, not finding the care that they need in the community. And they're certainly not finding it behind bars either. And, and there's all these issues around continuity of care as well. Um, in terms of like people coming into jails and not having access to medicines that they had legal or illegal. You know, so there's a lot of issues with that. And of course, solitary confinement uh, is a pretty significant issue. Uh, and really just, you know, the, the lack of, of follow through on, on institutional policies. And so like, you know, you have people who are, you know, concerned about food, uh, concerned about uh, access to um, spiritual or cultural uh, programming, or, or even being able to observe their spirituality. So like, for instance, one of the things that, that we worked on in the spring around Ramadan was the fact that we had uh, Muslim prisoners who were uh, trying to observe uh, their fast during Ramadan. And uh, <clears throat> they were being told, well, you can either fast or you can have access to your food and medication. They wouldn't serve them the food and medication outside of fasting hours. So right. then you had Muslim men who were like, okay, what are we supposed to do here? Um, either I observe my faith or I, you know, survive. So um, we initiated a campaign with, including with a number of, of uh Muslim organizations, uh, prominent ones across Canada. There was over 60 organizations that signed up to a a campaign that was put on by our lead coordinator, Suhail Bensaman, who actually did some time at OCDC at one point. And uh, yeah, and through that, uh, the ministry folded pretty quickly and rightfully so, because I I mean, they were violating the human rights of of Muslim prisoners in, in their 
um, care. Um, and so uh, they, they then acknowledged that, that, that they would indeed serve the food and medication outside of fasting hours. So that was kind of resolved. I mean, it's these kind of issues that, that are kind of recurring and, and that prisoners need support for and solidarity with people on the outside to work on over a long-term basis, not just in these flash in the pants, uh, pan moments, but like that were consistently there for people. I mean, indigenous prisoners right now, uh, at OCDC, for instance, lack access to, to, uh, ceremonies, uh, during change of season, they missed their ceremony on, on June 21st. And that wasn't the first time it had happened. Lack of access to their sacred medicines. I mean, these are things that, that like, you know, old jail, new jail, whatever, should not be happening so long as we are imprisoning people. And arguably, you know, these are some of the things that we run up against that make absolutely no sense that um, can be rectified within the constraints of the current system. And that signal to us that we need to, to do away with it or work or work ourselves away from it over the short term, medium term and long term in, in different kinds of ways. And for us, you know, that means moratoriums on growth. So stopping uh, prison expansion, stopping different ways that people end up going into those systems. And then, yeah, trying to find ways to divert people from custody to decarcerate people uh, that are in prison now and, and get them out and keep them out. And then, uh, of course, trying to build communities that are capable of providing the care needed to address p- the needs of people that, you know, uh, that are uh, according to dominant discourse, considered to be dangerous, right? So can we can we try and imagine other ways of doing things other than locking people up? And I, I don't think those are easy questions or an easy challenge to, to get into. But I, I mean, we do know that imprisonment perhaps is, is the most, uh, it's most costly, uh, certainly the least effective uh, and, and certainly most unjust when we look at who's in, who ends up in our prisons. Uh, most unjust approach to, to doing this and, and we, we should be trying other things. And I, I think we'll get into this later, I suppose, but I think COVID provides us, could have provided us with a moment uh, to rethink things in a radical way. But I, I, I think that we've, we've missed some opportunities there, um, even though we've seen some, some interesting things happen as a result of the current situation. <laughs> That's perfect sort of transition because that's what I wanted to sort of uh, go to. I mean, uh, as the time that we're recording this, we are many, many months into the uh, COVID pandemic and it's, there's been different kind of consequences uh, for incarcerated people and for the system generally. So I just want to start at the broadest level and then I want to drill down with you into sort of some of those more pragmatic micro deals. So at, at, the, at the broadest level, I mean, what's your sense of how prepared the sort of Canadian correctional establishment was for an event like this? Well, yeah, I, I, and I, I, I don't think they were terribly well prepared. Um, but I mean, I think we could say that about a whole host of, of our institutions more broadly in, in, in uh, Canada. Um, but I mean, with respect to, to prisons, we did see during the first wave of the pandemic, some pretty uh, significant uh, outbreaks. For instance, you know, the Correctional Service of Canada had uh, pretty large outbreaks. And here we're talking like dozens of people, and in some cases, hundreds of people uh, at Port Cartier Institution, uh, which was a bit of a smaller outbreak, uh, Joliet Institution for Women, Federal Training Center just outside of Montreal uh, had an outbreak where there was like over 150 prisoners that got in- infected with COVID-19. Uh, there was as well pretty significant outbreak in, um, I believe it was Mission Institution out in, in BC. And so CSC at, at one point uh, I'd have to look at the the numbers here again. At one point, they they had I think around uh, 360 uh, cases uh, of prisoners, and then you know hundreds of staff on top of that during the the first few months of the pandemic. And you know there were stories that were coming out of places like Mission Institution that that like public health authorities were coming in there and being like, you know, what are what are you doing here? <laughs> like you're you're not you're not 
keeping people separated properly in between different units. There's staff going in between units. There's, there's a lot of things that, that were happening that shouldn't be happening. And what's interesting, I think, when looking at CSC's response initially, which was, you know, they, they had for, for some time more cases than the provinces and territories, for the past five months, their numbers, as far as prisoners go, haven't moved at all. So like they were at 360 at the end of May and they're at 360 now if we look online. And, and so clearly things have, have changed um, as far as, as their ability to manage it. And one of the questions we, we have to ask ourselves is, is, okay, so how are they going about doing this and what kinds of sacrifices are being made to, because we understand with COVID being the communicable disease that it is, you do need to restrict movement for for the numbers to drop and for nothing to happen in in five months to me is astonishing um and and probably indicates the level of austerity that exists behind bars right now in federal penitentiaries and there's certainly accounts from prisoners in the forthcoming issue of the journal of prisoners on prisons that's coming out in december that that will speak to that 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 you know essentially frequent lockdowns are being used in the name of of social distancing, that solitary confinement or segregation like conditions are being used for people uh, who are symptomatic, uh, you know, when they're even when they're entering, uh, being admitted into the system, you know, being placed on a range in, in isolation for a couple weeks and then uh, moving in uh, elsewhere into institutions. And, you know, there was a bit of relaxation over the summer in terms of visits and programming and stuff, but it, it, it does appear that uh, there's more and more of those uh, initial restrictions that we saw in the first wave coming back. And so you have a lot of folks in the federal penitentiary system where there hasn't been a lot of releases who are essentially there because, you know, public safety minister Blair and, and others within the system are saying these are folks that are serving sentences of two years plus a day. It's not like petty things that have them in there. Uh, we need to keep them in there. Uh, for the public to be safe. That's, you know, what they're saying. And we all have to ask ourselves is, is, you know, okay, how safe are we all going to be down the road when folks have been treated like this for, you know, right now it's been like three, eight, eight months, eight months into the pandemic by now, like it's been a long time uh, and we're all kind of doing the grind in our own lives. So, you know, imagine what that looks like when you've spent most of your time in a cell without access to programming or with infrequent access to visitors, uh, only being able to speak to your, your loved ones uh, so, by phone. You know, so before we then. drill down any more into the specifics, which is what I want to do, yeah. um, not everyone who's going to be listening to this will be a prison expert. They may not have had lived experience. So maybe just start at the, at the general level. What you know, prisons are, are total institutions. They share similarities with some other total institutions. But what are the you know unique or characteristic features of these you know carceral spaces that are challenging for confronting or addressing or managing this situation yeah i mean at a, at a most basic level i suppose depending on the institution that you're in and how they're configured you know you have anywhere between 20 to 40 people usually living on a range or a unit where they they're sharing most often access to space for recreation time or, or some work that they may do for programs for making phone calls for accessing meals so you know these are these are spaces where there's a lot of contact and close contact with people and, you know, staff members coming in and out of the institution every day prior to the pandemic, visitors coming in and out of the institution every day, people from the community who may be providing programming or just volunteering and so on. And so, you know, these are kinds of it, sites that are, that are like long-term care homes or like schools or other, well, less so schools, but other kinds of closed institutions where where if if covid gets in it can spread in a hurry right and we've seen that with with like right now as we're speaking you know manitoba during the first wave of the pandemic their prisons had no covid cases 
<clears throat> and now you have basically, I think there's only one institution, the Pass Correctional Center in their complement of youth and adult institutions that doesn't have COVID. Like the rest of them have it and like places like Headingley have, you know, um, a ton of cases uh, in your neck of the woods in, in uh, Alberta. Now, uh, the Calgary Correctional yeah. Center took off just like crazy here like a week ago. Yeah, and, and during the first wave, Alberta didn't have much to speak of in terms of COVID transmission, right? And I think there's been a minor outbreak at the Edmonton Remand Center, but nothing compared to what, what folks are seeing in, in Calgary, right? So, you know, the, the potential is there and, and uh, it, it's been actualized in, in um, cases where, you know, some jurisdictions had performed relatively well in the first wave of the pandemic. And now they're the ones that are having these huge outbreaks. And maybe to some extent, it does reflect what's happening more broadly in the community with respect to the uh, pandemic, particularly in, in Manitoba. But Ontario had some pretty significant outbreaks in its uh, facilities, including the uh, Brampton Jail or the Ontario uh, Correctional Institute, which actually shut down completely during the first wave because of uh, COVID-19 transmission with prisoners and staff. And so, um, you know, these are, you know, places where things can happen and things can happen very quickly. And I think to my, and, and who knows, by the time this airs or, or by the time, uh, you know, a month passes or so, maybe CSE will again have major outbreaks, but it appears that they must be, they must have changed their, their uh, particularly the, how the staff uh, come in and out of the institutions because <clears throat> they, they were placing restrictions on visitation and, and putting prisoners in, in isolation for two weeks uh, during the first wave of the pandemic. And that didn't stop a few major outbreaks, but now, you know, they're continuing on with those things. Plus <clears throat> they're uh, it seems that they're, they must be doing a lot more. Um, this is speculation to some extent and, and the research I'm doing with Kevin on COVID-19 and filing access to information requests will maybe reveal this later on, but they must be doing a lot more stricter uh, screening processes for staff uh, to, to keep things out and to keep staff at home, you know, when they're, when they're symptomatic, which is, you know, uh, a big, a big change compared to what was happening during the, the, the first wave. But we have to gain back to what I was saying prior to this was just like, what are the long-term public safety implications of that? Like when you literally lock down these facilities or when you put these, these tight restrictions and people aren't getting access uh, to programming or things to do with their minds, you know, we're all kind of um, out here with stuff, stuff to do, find, feeling the stress, right? And, and feeling the, the, the mental health impacts. And what does that look like for people who are inside? And so, and how does that improve our C, I suppose? But uh, yeah, did that answer your question about like what? Like That's the, the, potential? the contextual stuff, because like a, lots of like prisons are, anyone who studied a prison knows they're very distinctive and unique places. They share some similarities, but they're, you know, they are distinctive. One of the one of the um, strategies approaches that's been used to try and deal with this is some sort of level um, of limited decarceration. I just wanted to get your sense on how how that's unfolded, um, the challenges of this, the effectiveness of this, um, because it's certainly you know one of the more prominent noteworthy developments. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, so um, federally, I think there's there's not really much to report you know in the first wave or or the second wave they they they've decided early on and they've stuck with it that they were going to try to put a bit more resources in the parole system to process more cases but that they weren't going to do these kinds of mass uh releases that that we have seen perhaps in other some other jurisdictions so they've kind of held the line and, and a lot of their uh, reductions in population federally is where people are serving sentences of two years mine, uh, plus a day, I should say, are attributed to the fact that, that the court system was stopping, right? So like people weren't, weren't actually being uh, processed out of the provincial system into the federal system if they were on remand before or they weren't making their way up into the federal system. Uh, as much as they had previous to that. So like the population kind of went down 
uh, in that regard a bit, but it, it was not, you know, I think at one point they were saying like, it, it, it wasn't like anything that, that was terribly remarkable in terms of what was happening before the pandemic. <clears throat> Provincially and territorially where people, you know, are awaiting their trials and um, serving sentences of two years minus a day, uh, there was a lot more movement like so there was um you know quite early on in the pandemic <clears throat> most of the provinces and territories uh had moved towards issuing temporary absences first for people who were serving weekend sentences or intermittent sentences um so like you know did it make sense to have people who live with their families and work jobs uh during the community five days a week and to suddenly bring them in, in and out of prisons on friday and monday no that doesn't make sense okay we will They'll do their time at home instead. Um, there was some releases in terms of people nearing uh, parole uh, and, and trying to get people out that way. And of course, because uh, more than 50% of provincial territorial prisoners across this country are awaiting trial, uh, there was a lot of significant work that went into having Crown attorneys work with defense attorneys to try and release people on bail by consent. And then as well as a lot of contested bail hearings as well with defense lawyers kind of pushing things through, I think in part because they had the time to do it because the, 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 the criminal trials weren't going through. So right. they had to do something else with their time. So, right. I mean, I, I, I think that that had something to do with it as well, that they were able to try and focus on getting bail reviews and getting people out. So you had uh, during the first wave of the pandemic. So like we're talking March, April, May, um, you know, more than 6,000 provincial territorial prisoners being no longer incarcerated, right? So I should just qualify that, that the population went down right. uh, by 6,000. So before the pandemic, there was about 24, 25,000 provincial territorial prisoners. Right. And then by, by the end of the first wave, we were looking at about 6,000 uh, fewer. And it was uneven across the country, and we can get into that in a second, but uh, that that's like... Uh, you know, almost 20 to 25 percent of provincial right. territorial prisons went down at, for a long time. And, and like I've been studying in prison expansion construction uh, for for a long time. And for years, like they were saying, you know, we can't be doing things like using temporary absences for weekend prisoners and we right. can't and we can't like we're not the courts control bail, which is true. But if governments work together, if different actors within the system work together towards an objective, and I think during the first wave, people really didn't know what COVID was or what kind of impact it could have on people's health. So there was a bit of a, a bit of a, a push to, to just get people out for, for prevention and public health reasons. Um, that resulted in this kind of pretty significant drop, which, you know, and in some jurisdictions like Nova Scotia, 50% yeah. uh, of their, their prison population uh, was either diverted or decarcerated, right? So we saw a pretty significant depopulation. And then I think, interestingly, and, and there'll, there'll be some stuff written about this, I'm sure, governments that were led by uh, conservative premiers were releasing prisoners uh, uh, like pretty significantly as well. So like you had in Doug Ford's Ontario and he's not like, you couldn't confuse him with someone who's like sympathetic to criminalize people by any means. At one point at the height of the pandemic, Ontario had decar or depopulated, I should use the proper word here, depopulated uh, over 30% of its prisoners, you know? And so, and you could look at Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, like all, all the, and Quebec was about 20%. Um, so like there's, there's some pretty big um, movement here. And I think they could do it because, I mean, who's going to come after conservative governments for, for doing that stuff? Whereas if, if liberal or NDP governments are in power, I think it, it leaves them a bit more vulnerable to being called soft on crime or or whatnot so i think that there's a lot of i mean it's kind of counterintuitive but there's a lot of possibilities sometimes with with right-wing governments in place where depopulation is concerned uh in in crises in moments like these um now um what does it mean that's happening on the flip side of that of course is like you know for playing around with this concept of contradictory and volatile punishment that that um, Pat O'Malley advances, like you have this liberatory potential on the one hand, and then you have really the tightening of the screws on the other and like these pretty austere 
things happening <clears throat> behind the walls that that are troubling to say the least and i think the so long-term does, impact of which will will have to be studied quote co closely does it does it make sense that it's the provincial system given the sort of the often extremely short period of time that people are incarcerated just the, the logic i mean does it reveal the logic of the absurdity of incarcerating people for eight days <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're right, right? Like, um, you know, that we have uh, over time and, you know, Tony Dube and Cheryl Webster have studied this pretty extensively, like that we have these, this culture of adjournment that kicks like the remand ball or the bail ball further down uh, the field and keeps a lot of people locked up uh, to, to resolve their bail matters, first right. of all. And then there's also like this culture of risk aversion where, judges or prosecutors and other actors within the system are reluctant to free people awaiting trial because they don't want it to come back to them in different ways if they you know are accused of another criminalized act while they're out there so yeah i think it is there's, there was a lot of potential i think provincially and territorially for for releases just based on common sense let alone like abolitionist logic we could get into that as right. well but like from from a from a mainstream common sense perspective, it, it, it made sense that, that the provinces and territories would be leading the way or that, that these developments happened. But I think too, like federally, um, you know, there's, there's criminological research indicating that there's not really much usefulness in long-term sentences. So like <clears throat> for, for the vast majority of people that are, that are locked up. And so the fact that we haven't seen releases federally I think to some extent reflects kind of common sense taking hold and, and not allowing for more reasonable policies of last resort to, to kind of kick in um, just because of the amount of public outrage it would probably engender for the federal government, which is a liberal government. You know, if, if, uh, if Harper was in power and wanted to decarcerate, who was going to say anything about it, you know, um, but, uh, but, but we'll have to, we'll have to look at that. That's something to study for sure is to look at like, how does party affiliation impact how how people critique decarceration? So I, I think it'd be interesting to see. Like, did anyone really raise that many concerns about it? I know that that some victims groups were concerned about it, uh, notably groups uh, concerning uh, violence against women uh, were concerned about about this. And you know, I think one thing we could say is that many jurisdictions did not see. Like, it's not like we were inundated with newspaper stories in the spring, summer, and the fall about a, a huge wave of victimization happening because of releases. Of course, there, there were a few, a few incidents for sure, but, you know, that, that's, uh, I think, indicates the kind of lack of imagination around building community as well that did not happen during the pandemic, like, that that we we released or are right. diverted you're, people. You're, right, you're That's, you're getting you're getting ahead of us here because I want to get yeah. to that. But I did want to you know I wanted to um, stay on the sort of the community response. I mean, this is a very diff I realize it's a hard question to answer, but do you in terms of the public, whatever that might be. I mean, do you, do you get a sense of the public response to kind of the the depopulation has been kind of indifference um openness to it like a welcoming of it um hostility sort of or does it does it vary dramatically I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to get my finger on sort of my, my sense is that this was i mean i'll just speak for myself it was mostly indifference in the in the context of everything else that was going on which may be the best we could hope for i'm not sure yeah no I'm, i i would tend to agree with that that there was a lot of indifference with respect to uh, what was happening to prisoners inside, which I think has obviously some some negative consequences associated with that. That people, for folks who remain behind bars, that that a lot of people just didn't care because they were dealing with their own stuff. I think also at the same time with the releases that that indifference didn't lead to a large upswell of people saying, "Hey, Doug Ford, what are you doing?" Right. right. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it works, uh, it cuts both ways. And yeah, I, I think, again, that'd be something interesting to, to study a bit further in terms of how, how the news engaged it. There, there wasn't really a lot of pushback 
uh, that way either. Like there was some news outlets that I, that, you know, I was tracking this in the, in the spring where that we're talking about like the kinds of people that were being released um, and some facing some, some serious charges and having a bit of discussion about that. But really most people right now are concerned about their jobs or concerned about not getting COVID of having their loved ones not get COVID, of, of trying to kind of get by right. this period. And so, yeah, I, I think that there were so many other things on the register for people that this is just something that kind of flew under the radar for the most part, even as news outlets picked, picked it up. But I think too, like just trying to re- reflect on everything that's kind of happened yeah it's been pretty remarkable i think that you could have that kind of a a shift without without things really being disturbed right. all that much which kind of gets back to the i think your your point you made earlier is like what was the fuss with keeping them locked up in the first place right mm-hmm. and you know i think we could do more if if there was political will to do it and and i think now though in the second wave as things become normalized we're starting to see incarceration uh, levels creep up in some jurisdictions. So for instance, in Ontario, where at one point they had really uh, depopulated over 30% of their prison population. As of the end of September, it was around 20% of what it was prior to the pandemic. So things are starting to go back in the other direction as people get used to it. And as people get more complacent and are like, Oh, maybe, you know, a lot of prisoners might have gotten it during the first wave, but they didn't die. So, you know, um, so I think there's that that complacent complacency within the system and in the judiciary as well, in terms of thinking about bail releases that are starting to have things tick the other direction. So we'll see, you know, with some of these bigger outbreaks happening again, there was, you know, a pretty calm summer in that respect. But now that things are back on um, in the community. Uh, in our communities, I should say, that, you know, we may see more more outbreaks happen and maybe that that gets judges and justices of the peace and prosecutors and defense attorneys able to move again on this, which, I mean, they should. I mean, there, there's, uh, there's a, a lot of, of room that we could have within the current system, even with our communities organized as they are present uh, to do things and imagine if we actually spent some of these billions of dollars of, of COVID stimulus money on actually building things like housing and mental health and, and drug use supports, you know, we could definitely have a bigger impact in terms of, of doing less imprisonment while we work towards uh, abolition, or at least some of us do. (laughs) So, so on this, I mean, I, I cut you off earlier, but I think, you know, as there was this depopulation going on, what was your sense or the people that you know or talk to about the situation awaiting those people? Was it any different than the usual situation when people were released? Was this, you know, or were people just dumped? Were there, was there an infrastructure? So just any thoughts on that? Um, you know, there was a, a variety of different um, abolitionist and even liberal reform oriented groups that were advocating for diversion and decarceration and, and, and advocating for, you know, more transitional housing, permanent supportive housing, uh, drug decriminalization, safe supply, harm reduction, treatment, mental health supports, peer supports. And um, yeah, I think it, it's probably one of the most disappointing things that, that, um, that, you know, researching and and doing community organizing around this that 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 I observed was just like and and you know many others have observed is the the lack of community supports that were put in place for people coming out of prison or jails or, or other carceral facilities like federally hearing from from parolees that certainly some halfway house uh changes were made that that you know sometimes they were actually not uh, there were fewer people in the halfway houses um, at some points of the pandemic to try and create more distancing between people and that kind of clogging things up from people being able to get out. Right. Um, so that being, you know, uh, a problem, um, certainly in terms of limiting the potential of what was happening in terms of releases federally. But yeah, like, I mean, um, people were 
you know, sometimes well, I shouldn't say sometimes, like there was a significant amount of people who were released straight into homelessness. Right. And with as many buildings that emptied out during the first fa- uh, phase of the pandemic, that didn't have to happen. Uh, there could have been other things that could have been brought online to, to try and deal with, with that. You know, and I it, like really like the summer lull, like it's pretty surprising that 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 kind of lull wasn't used to try and build up the capacity uh, in the community to divert and decarcerate people for the second wave. You know, Particular, particularly as it became clear that this was not a two month situation, that this was yeah. something that's kind of we're going to have to be dealing with sort of for well, an indeterminate period of time. Yeah, it's, so uh, but I mean, I guess it's not necessarily isolated just to uh, the correction system, like we also saw with like schools, um, at least here in Ontario, like where there was like no plan. I know this because my wife's a teacher um, and, you know, my kids are going to school and like there's like literally no plan a couple days before going back to back to school. Right. And you're just like, OK, you had like months to deal with this and like nothing. And so when we think about, you know, what could have been put in place uh, in the community, you know, the kinds of, of jobs that could have been uh, created in, in care that, you know, students from our programs or like other, other people uh, with lived experience could have had to walk alongside those that are kind of going through issues that they had dealt with in the past. Um, there's a lot of potential and it's un- unrealized and it's, it's uh more than unfortunate and yeah i I guess it it uh it suggests at least that that um while you know there were while the pandemic has shown like you know various uh pandemics of inequality if we want to call it that that uh we're not addressing these things uh in a kind of permanent structural way and that uh once this is all done with, um, if that ever comes to be that it's going to be kind of business as usual, which is, you know, pushes a lot of people further to the margins and, and further to places like jails and and prisons and penitentiaries, which is, you know, um, we, we have seen announcements for new and bigger, uh, prison spaces uh, that are coming down the line during the course of this pandemic, um, sometimes in the name of economic recovery. So like we know, uh, Newfoundland uh, is planning on replacing Her Majesty's Penitentiary. Uh, per, I mean, it's not the first time they've said that. They've been saying that for like decades. Right. Um, so, you know, will they do that in St. John's? Um, Cape Breton in Nova Scotia, which is extremely economically depressed, is looking at building a uh, new prison there. You know, PEI has been musing for a number of years and still musing about whether or not they'll build new new prisons uh, in Ottawa, where I'm from, you know, outside of here, as I mentioned previous when we were talking uh, about the NOPE campaign, uh, building a new prison in Kempville, replacing the jail in Brockville with a new and bigger one, uh, expanding a couple other facilities. They're talking about replacing the jail in Thunder Bay uh, with a new and bigger facility and yeah, I, and then west of that, uh, I'm just trying to think if anything has come up with on, on the radar. Um, are you aware of anything that's happening in Alberta? Or, or... They, they do talk about replacing the um, uh, the Calgary, well, I got to get them right, the Calgary Correctional Center, which is the old one of the older prisons in Canada. So they do talk about this when we were, you know, some of the people we know have sort of said that this is coming down the pipe, but uh, I have not seen any ex- well, actually, I did see some explicit plans, but I think they were actually a decade old and mm-hmm. things have moved on. So, but that's that, that would be my estimation of the next, if they're going to do this, that would be the next initiative. So, yeah. And so, keep, like, these keep, are your eyes, keep your eyes on that one. <laughs> yeah. These are the kinds of fights I think that are, that are coming up for um, abolitionist organizers is like, okay, there's about to be post pandemic, probably a lot of infrastructure money that's going to come available federally and provincially and territorially to kind of do some stuff to, to re restart the economy or, or kind of get it moving. <laughs> and, yeah. And so, um, you know, for these, these kinds of facilities, usually a, a facility is in the works for a long period of time before it actually ever comes to fruition. Right. So, um, a lot of, uh, of folks working within the bureaucracies of prison authorities might be 
you know, getting ready to kind of put their plans out there to try and use this as a moment to move forward. And I think for abolitionists anyways, this is the moment to say, you know, that, that we're going to build communities, not cages and try and get this money into building the infrastructure we need to prevent victimization uh, to the extent that's possible. And then to try and respond to things in different ways to the extent that we can, of course, understanding that, that there may be some uh, situations that, uh, that that's not possible until some major structural change happens. And I mean, that's, I mean, we're talking about like, can you end colonialism and can you end capitalism and can you end racism and, and white supremacy? Can you end, can you end um, patriarchy and misogyny that leads to, to violence against women? Can you end, um, you know, heteronormativity and so on, ableism and other structures that, that see people getting harmed interpersonally? And, you know, I'm not romantic to the extent that I believe that like, no violence will occur, or we can build a society where that happens. But, you know, I think we could do certainly a lot better than we are. And uh, I don't think structural change is afoot. It's been pretty disappointing that COVID, uh, as of right now, hasn't kind of sparked more revolutionary groundswell of, of, uh, of ways of thinking about what the future could look like. Um, but we'll see. I mean, at the same time, there's huge, huge movements afoot with, um, you know, Black Lives Matter and scholars and organizers like Robin Maynard and Al Jones and Cyrus Marcus Ware and Sandy Hudson and others who are like making things speakable, like police defunding and police abolition, which in ways that, that um, you know, uh, having been researching and teaching this stuff for a long time, well, a long, at least a long time for me, you know, it's, 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 surprising to see that that things have at least be, become thinkable and speakable in ways that I don't think have been in, in my lifetime and and perhaps more speakable and thinkable than they were when abolitionism previously enjoyed its heyday in the 1960s and 70s so yeah. Yeah. um so we talked about sort of the the conditions of release I mean what's your sense of the kind of the ongoing problems or challenges for the people who've been left behind because there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, as we mentioned previously, like just the fact that people are dealing with all these deprivations that are like well beyond what the quote unquote normal or what we could say are normalized deprivations that people were facing uh, pre-pandemic times. So, you know, not having access in many jurisdictions to visitations, not having access to, to programming, not having you know, things, a lot of things to do with their time, um, being a lot of time in cell, that kind of thing, um, you know, having to choose, for instance, between phone calls and showers, differential access, depending on what jurisdiction you're in to PPE and face masks and cleaning uh, right. supplies and, and uh, uh, hygiene products, you know, these things, it's, it's quite uneven. And I think like part of the work that, that Kevin and I are doing with uh, Kevin Welby and I are doing around uh, around like looking at uh, policies and practices through access to information requests across all the country that maybe will will kind of get a sense of of what was happening uh, at least on paper uh, across the country and how 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 policies differed and how people were talking about practice in, in official documents that aren't publicly available at the moment. So. Yeah, I think it, it's like the people who are who have been left behind are are, you know, they're still at risk of of getting COVID. They're they're living in more austere conditions than they were prior to this, and and are they themselves better off? And by connection, their loved ones and their communities that they'll most will eventually return to. I think that there's a lot of despair and a lot of hopelessness right now. So another thing, and I'm just kind of putting like research questions on the table as well, because like clearly there's a lot of things we don't know, but like, you know, how have, you know, self-harm and uh, deaths by suicide, how, how have the, those gone up since the pandemic started or, or, or has there been no impact at all? Mm -hmm. uh, use of force incidents, you know, looking at, at uh, other kinds of incidents and prison disturbances, um, like there has been in part uh, because of, of um, 
of people being desperate, uh, a number of hunger strikes, for instance, in Ontario, um, uh, jails and, and prisons. So, um, you know, will that, uh, will that uh, you know, how does that differ from, from pre-pandemic times? So it's all these kinds of things that we kind of need to look into to see how the carceral landscape is, is shifting or kind of staying the same in a lot of regards. So there's, I mean, my, my yeah. sense is there's, there's kind of a, I don't, I don't, I don't like the word irony, but I'm, I don't have another word for it. There, but there's this irony that at the moment in Canada where there was really a movement to kind of reduce or transform solitary confinement, we end up in a situation that COVID pushes everybody into these kind of even more, you know, solitary spaces again. So it's just, it's one of those, you know, strange attributes of this situation. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what the courts have to say about that too, right? Like I, I with, uh, I'm sure there'll be a number of, of cases that will be litigated across the country on that very point. Um, and, you know, the whole, uh, the whole dube, dube affair with CSC not being able to get access to, to data for a while and, and, you know, them trying to kind of uh, protect data for the, or, or not give data initially really to the extent that was agreed upon to, to allow people to verify independently what exactly was happening, what, what changed kind of suggests that there's a lot of, of duplicity going on there in terms of just like the linguistic gymnastics of renaming practices and just keeping on with things. I mean, Justice Cole and Kelly Hannah Moffitt, you know, studied what, what's happened as a result of the, uh, Jean rem remedies and Christina Jean was uh, someone living with cancer and mental health issues who was incarcerated for over 200 days at OCDC in solitary confinement. Um, and she had brought forward um, some litigation and the province had agreed to these series of, of remedies and uh, Justice Cole and Kelly Hannah Moffat essentially found that, that a lot of those remedies were not put in place and that solitary confinement or segregation is pretty alive and well in Ontario. Um, despite uh, you know, uh, on paper ministerial efforts to kind of reduce its use, you know, and restrict it, especially for people living with mental health issues. So yeah, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting time of how things, how things change and how, how they sometimes stay the same. So staying with the people who, who got left behind, assuming the people were going to be left behind, I mean, what could have happened inside that to kind of alleviate some of these, you know, pains of COVID imprisonment that maybe didn't, or that should, you know, the things that should have happened. Well, I mean, I, I think uh, one one thing that kind of prefaces everything I'm about to say would be that that you know we could have released more people and built more community structures um, to be able to. Uh, bring people back into the community in ways that would have freed up a lot more space uh, within those institutions to con continue on with things like schooling and programming and, and um, you know, um, perhaps with, with less prisoners, you could have more staffing resources to facilitate visiting in a, in a safe way free phone calls, um, you know, Ontario put in place 52 minutes of long distance free calling for prisoners during the COVID crisis, like we could have seen um, more things being done that way. Um, you know, universities are now teaching entire entire things, uh, entire programs now and in, in courses remotely. So, you know, why, um, why couldn't, uh, for instance, um, prison authorities have found uh, more ways um, to, to bring technology into the institutions for, for prisoners to you know, do something productive uh, with their time if they're if they insist that they can't be let out. Yeah, I, I think just trying to find other ways to ensure community connections and and um, to to allow for more uh, more movement with fewer people, I think would have been something that that would uh, would at least uh, allow people to get through these difficult times in better ways than, than what's happening presently. And I mean, the way that people are being treated right now and the kinds of, of lockdown conditions they're facing, 
when those people come back, like what's that? Like, I, I mean, that, that's a, that's a good research project for something to do is like what for someone to do is like what, what's happening with those people when they come back, having gone through this for such a long period of time. It can't, it, I don't know. I mean, my hypothesis would be, it can't be good, but no. <laughs> I, mean, I suppose, I suppose we, we do need to do the research to see what, what, what happens. Right. And, and well, I mean, this, uh, this, this is personal. I remember I, uh, so, uh, a guy I know who was released a few months into it and he'd been incarcerated for decades. And um, yeah, it was just, he was describing, and I, I knew his spouse, just describing how strange it was to, that, to appreciate the COVID situation on the outside. You know, so you know, he'd say things like, this was early in the, in the lockdown, like, well, let's just go to the malls. Like, there are no malls. <laughs> you know, this was when, you know, so trying to even just appreciate things that we normalized about sort of distancing and face masks, et cetera, fairly quickly, you know, even that took a while too. So anyway, yeah, on it's on your point about how would people who are released sort of, um, what's their situation? Um, sort of the last series of questions, sort of uh, as a passionate abolitionist, one of the questions I wanna ask you is kind of how that's related to, you know, the relevance of abolitionism to sort of Canadian politics and prisons today. Well, I mean, you've been talking around this, I think, but um, I'm just yeah. going to put, put it to you. No, I think like, I, I, I think that that for abolitionists, this was like, you know, you had organizers from various different groups come together and form new relationships. Like there's an abolition coalition now that's comprised of various abolitionist groups across the country. There's new abolitionist groups now um, that have been organizing. So, I mean, I think this is kind of the COVID moment where people, you know, felt that people's lives were on the line, actually like forced uh, a lot of folks to get organized and to build relationships to, to try and achieve um, some abolitionist gains uh, during this. So that's been interesting um, to see. And, you know, some, some organizations have been pretty um, groups have been pretty successful in, in seeing those changes come to fruition. So like, for instance, the East Coast Prison Justice Society, uh, based in, in Halifax, uh, early on in the pandemic, released like lengthy letters uh, to the Justice Minister in Nova Scotia, explaining to them how they could achieve significant diversion and decarceration. And a lot of those measures were adopted uh, and resulted in significant, like 50, almost 50% depopulation um, during the first wave. So, you know, I think that there's been some some interesting uh, gains in organizing that's happened through all of this. I think it does show perhaps people to people within the system that we can actually achieve some of these so-called radical things that people have been calling for in incremental ways. And so, you know, for to think to the future, could we, could we imagine uh, that we're the generation that might stop the further growth of imprisonment. Can we imagine that the next generation could perhaps, you know, have transformative justice ways of responding uh, to conflict and harms within their schools and then imagine down the road that that punishment might not be an appropriate response to conflicts and harms um, in ways that, that could see more people being diverted and decarcerated. Could we could we end imprisonment or 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 come close to it within you know two generations from now? I think that that we we could with a with a shift in you know if this police defunding movement picks up, if we actually invest funds that are divested from policing into people into communities rather than kind of do what happened during the anti psychiatry kind of wow. phase of decarceration, which was okay, get them out of institutions and then don't do anything in the community, which yeah. is not what abolitionists at the time were calling for, but that's what happened, you know? So if we can actually build community capacity uh, for care and compassion, then we could get to uh, a radically different place if we allow ourselves to, to think it and bring it into um, practice, I guess. But um yeah, like it, 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 it's clear that there's, you know, still 
uh, considerable resistance to that. There's a lot of, of co-optation that you can see happening. So like, for instance, where, where I'm at on unceded and unsurrendered Algonquin territory um, in Ottawa, uh, you know, the people have been calling for divesting uh, from uh, policing in response to mental health crises. Uh, and, you know, because of, of, of deaths of, of young black men like Abdi Rahman Abdi uh, and others, and they've now the police are going to have a mental health unit within the police that are that and they're like it's under their purview to do this right so like there's this kind of re rejigging of the a reorganization of the deck chairs on the Titanic to use Senator Pate's uh, Kim Pate's um, wording in police forces not just the prisons that she was most concerned about when when she was with E. Fry uh, during her career but you know, so there's all these kinds of things I think we need to pay attention to as as abolitionists put forward ideas, and they start getting picked up in the mainstream. One thing you have to ask yourself as an abolitionist is, okay, as some things do get picked up, what the heck is actually happening? Is it that that we're actually seeing some structural changes, or or instead have have hegemonic forces transformed us or transformed? the alternatives in ways that that are kind of leading to in Stan Cohen's words more of the same you know it's an interesting time things are moving things are moving at least there's that things are moving and and at least that's something and whether it moves in unanticipated problematic ways or 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 leads to like some pretty radical progressive kinds of changes that depends on struggle and we're in it so we'll see what happens right so the, the last question for you, sort of related to all of this, is I mean, looking at the last six plus months, do you think there have been any important lessons for abolitionists and to learn from, you know, well, I'll let you decide. Yeah, I mean, I, there, there's, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's a really good question. I, I think one thing that, that, I've thought a lot about is, for instance, like when when you're advocating uh, for diversion and decarceration, and you're you're advocating really forcefully for community capacity to be built, and and seeing that some people are 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 being dumped into homeless shelters or or precarious situations that are precarious in ways that are takes them from one form of precarity in the prison to another one out in the community. I suppose that 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 it, it does indicate. I need to think about more deeply about strategies that can actually get the goods <laughs> in the sense of, of, of building communities. Like how do we, how do we do that better? Cause it, it, it didn't happen um, in ways that it, it could have. So what went wrong on that score and, and how, how can we, you know, avoid reproducing the worst parts of, of uh, what happened when we decarcerated psychiatric institutions or many of them and, and, people found little help in the community and then ended up getting criminalized and sent into the penal system. Well, what, what's replacing the, the prison and, and could it be worse? I'm not sure. Cause like, I'm imagining like what's worse than a prison, a firing squad, but you know, right. <laughs> things, things shape shift over time in, 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 uh, in oh. state. And so we'll see. And then in terms of other stuff, I think, you know, kind of dealing with the question of the dangerous few question I think written a bit about this in my my own writing about like what do you do with folks that that have been labeled or deemed by the state or by you know the population more broadly as being folks that are seen as as uh, permanent security or safety threats that that are folks who are unrepentant or who haven't taken responsibility in the in the sense that would be amenable to transformative justice or, or other kinds of ways of of inspiring both individual and social change more broadly right. um okay so what do we do like and i think that that's like you know there wasn't i'm not saying most federal prisoners would even fit within that within canada but like certainly it's the specter of of those people um uh, that you know the people who are, who have you know uh, engaged in 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 several acts of murder or whatnot um, or other forms of of, of violence uh, that are in everyone's imaginations that block the release of of everyone else right um, and so I think until 
abolitionists can grapple with that uh, in a way that is convincing for people that we're going to continually come up against uh, right. that barrier. And I think if you if you if that domino falls, then the whole system falls. Um, this is so, you know, and Faye Honey Knopp, um, this radical feminist uh, who was part of uh, writing the book Instead of Prisons in 1976 that put together the, the attrition model. She spent her entire career working with dangerous few and working with people who um, engage in, in sexual harms and sexual harms against children. And that, that's kind of like what people have in the back of their minds. Um, so I think more COSAs, circles of support and accountability and, and more ways of bringing people into the community in ways that, that they're not treated as disposable and ways that don't lead to victimization could bring us to a place where we can see more radical changes happen down the road and which i think i mean obviously would be beneficial for for everyone if if uh, if we're able to to deal with interpersonal violence in a way that would help us diminish and perhaps eradicate state violence as well but i mean these are you know big <laughs> big impossible dreams right now but i think that you have to you have to think you have to kind of push through the impossible to kind of make it as matisse has talked about and uh, borrowing from max weber to make things possible to make the thinkable or the unthinkable thinkable and the unspeakable speakable and we'll see so i mean that's a, it's interesting with vanity here i mean um and i think this is just a discussion at this point but i think i i you know from you're you're way more connected in these communities than i am but i've always found exactly where you've ended up but when i talk to abolitionists and i mention you know i've meant, i've interviewed a guy who's raped multiple women at knife point repeatedly after being released and they say no we, we acknowledge that there's some of these people and we acknowledge that they have to be contained somehow okay so if that's true does abolitionist problem problem mm -hmm. it term terminological that if you call yourself an abolitionist people dismiss you but really you're not calling for the abolition of all containment of the most dangerous people you're calling for radical decarceration is that a, a terminal logically is that a more palatable and achievable project because people you know because i really that's that's my sense every abolitionist i've talked to and i said you do not actually mean abolitionism and they acknowledge that. so is that your sense or am i wrong um, well, I mean, the way that I would that I would uh, kind of engage with that is that um, I'm working towards ending imprisonment full stop as a long term objective. And even if we got to a point of radical decarceration where there was like 100 people left like that, that you describe or how many folks that would, would fit uh that description or in terms of the harms that they've engaged in and where they're at in their lives in terms of prospects for future harms so you know still at that point i would be striving to end imprisonment and trying to figure out other ways to to do it in ways that that would ultimately lead to safer communities so i think you can hold abolitionism in the way that sebastian Shear talked about it in a, an essay in 1986 about abolitionism being a, a sensitizing theory right. like it, it like gets you to think how can we push things to the greatest degree possible um and yeah i mean do i like do i think we could shut all the prisons down a day from now or a week from now or a month from now or even a year from now and this would be uh you know uh an ideal objective i think um it would be ideal in the sense that you would be ending the harm of imprisonment but then what are you doing about everything else can you can you build communities to deal with that and i guess the the answer would be well let's try and strive towards it right. um no but, i i i i think i'm not i'm not sort of in any way sort of challenging abolitionist goal my, my point is purely terminological does the term get in the way of achieving the goals um that's that's what i guess i'm getting at amongst the people who have the power to bring about sort of massive change does the term you know make people just too easily to be dismissed 
Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think that's a good strategic question. I think it's an open question um, in terms of, of uh, you know, because some would say like there's no, there's no way to maintain this in a way that wouldn't do violence to the communities that are currently subjected to it the most that are black indigenous people and, and other folks that have been pushed to the margins so but does it get in the way strategically like if you called yourself a minimalist would it be easier to push things through i don't know because at the same time like i think to myself canada for prior to harper anyways in, in political discourse had a kind of a consensus around you know last resort imprisonment and recognizing that imprisonment should only be used as a last resort and, and and people from all political stripes kind of aligning with that to to a greater or lesser extent for some time in the post-world war ii period in, in ways that tony dube and cheryl webster have talked about so you know um how, how like I, I think that there's um kind of some merit to thinking through this further in terms of is, is minimalism could it be more effective if if abolitionists or people who identify as abolitionists use that term to describe themselves would it Rad, be ra they radical be decarcerationists or yeah. something i guess that that would be that would be how i would sort of characterize myself but that's just yeah. that, that's why i come at it it's not out of a difference of objectives it's just out of a difference of kind of terminology i think yeah, but I, I think too, though, that, that um, I guess strategically how I think about it is if you have someone calling for abolition, if you have people saying free them all, it, and you have people holding that line, does it, does it mean you get dismissed or does it mean you bring other people closer to you? And I guess that's a kind of strategic question that, that you know, if you have a couple people that are doing that, that are, that are kind of forcing the discourse in that direction, then maybe maybe the minimalism folks actually can be more successful, but I don't know. I, I think that that's a good thing to think through. Right. Anyway, it's a good place to... Thank you for joining us for this episode of On Crime and Punishment. And once again, this is a podcast produced by the Center for Criminological Research at the University of Alberta. Please subscribe to our podcast through the Apple Podcast Store or any of the other major podcast services. And if you want to follow us on social media, you can find us at, at CCR underscore U of A on Twitter. Our website is CanadianCriminology.com. Our YouTube channel is YouTube.com slash C slash Center for Criminological Research.